This is gonna hurt. It's time, it's time for, the for the Suffering Podcast. Podcast. When we are entangled in the grips of evil, escape feels like an illusion. That monster is always one step ahead of us, as if it knows our every move. The fear is very real, and hope is in short supply. The fight for freedom from addiction is like being stuck in quicksand. The harder you struggle, the tighter its grip. You try to remain still so that the situation doesn't get any worse. But by doing nothing, you're still getting consumed, only at a slower pace. Those watching this may be unaware that you're slowly dying. They would show up in a second, if only they knew you were in danger. The moment you ask for a lifeline, many hands are there to pull you from the depths of certain death. I'm Kevin Donaldson here with Mike Felace, and on this episode of The Suffering Podcast, we sit down with our dear friend, Tom Schmittler, <laughs> to talk about the suffering of sobriety. Tom's taken a long path into living a sober life. Commonly Tom, known as Schmitty. Schmitty. So you're going to hear us, you're gonna hear us talk, tell, call you Schmitty every day, because Schmittler does not roll off my tongue very <laughs> No, much. it doesn't. It's better, still better than, than the, the, oh, the last names with a vowel. I can't pronounce any of those things. Oh, Felice? What kind of name is that? <laughs> Schmittlero. One, one, of, one of the shows we were on, we are calling him uh, Fellatio or Falachi oh. or something. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was bad. Yeah. Before we get started, let's, uh, let's give a big shout out and a thank you to our marquee sponsor. That's Toyota of Hackensack. Go to toyotahackensack.com. We buy our cars from there because they're one of the few people that we trust in the world and we don't trust too many people. So go to toyotahackensack.com and let them find you a car. And when you're driving home in your new Toyota, we have a brand new sponsor, and that's Frontline Cigars. Frontline is, I just want everybody to know, Frontline is one word. It's one word, because that's an inside joke between Steve, one of the owners, and I. It's, uh, it was started by two uh, police officers. One's a 15-year veteran. One's a 30-year veteran. They're Chicago-based, even though they're Patriots fans, which I don't understand. I just don't get it. But They're all confused out there. But they did something special for our listeners. So if you go to FrontlineCigars.com, put in the code TSP. Tango Sierra Papa TSP, you'll get a fifteen percent discount. Well, how about just say the Suffering Podcast, or you could do that. Right. Okay, geez, thanks. Not a problem. <laughs> Very valuable part of this show, you are. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, Smitty, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. Yeah. Got ninety days sober today. God bless you, man. That's great. I got to tell you, it was it was a thing of joy seeing you walk up the alley into the studio, and you you got. Just a the way you're, step. Yeah, the way you're walking. Mm. The way you're walking. You used to come to group and your head's held. We know yeah. we know Schmitty from group and you you know, your heads hang low and you know the occasional text here and there, then you'd go off the radar for so long. Yeah. It was hard to watch. And then, then the next sex were all drunken texts. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of those going around. Every week we try to interact with our audience because Mike doesn't like, you know, Mike's too big for our audience, but I interact with our audience. Uh, Again, I take a question from them every week. This week's question comes from Danny, and it says, what is the worst pain you ever felt? And what I took this to mean is it's not necessarily mean physical. It could be emotional pain because my theory is emotional pain is always the worst. So what do you think, Schmitty? Uh, definitely emotional pain. Yeah. Um, What's the worst one you ever experienced? It was recently, back in June, I spent five days in the hospital. I was all jacked up on meds and shit. And uh, I treated my fiance like shit. Mm. I had no recollection of it. Didn't know what was going on. Treated her like shit. And when I came out of it, she told me what I'd done, what I did to her, and I felt like crap. I felt like the worst person in the world. We just had a whole Instagram live before this show about consequences. You know, there's consequences to every one of our actions, and when we're in that spot that you were in, you're not thinking clearly. You're not thinking of your consequences. No, nah, I wasn't thinking of the wall. You I don't mean, think about the repercussions from it. How have you gone to repairing that relationship with your girlfriend? Just communication. Communication yeah. is key. Well, I'm working on it every day. And, uh, and a lot of gifts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, her birthday's coming up next month, so yeah. she'll be a good gift. But, uh, you know, Aruba's nice this time of year. Maybe yeah. you should take her to Aruba. I, you know, I, I, I can I, spend I, your money for you. I got no problem with that. Yeah, you, fuck you, Mike. <laughs> and it starts. And it starts. <laughs> We're three minutes in. I already got one fuck you out of it. <laughs> Mike, what do you think? What do you think the worst pain you ever felt is? Uh, aside from coming up here once a week, um, probably when my mom passed away. Yeah. Yeah. You only have one mother, yeah. you know, and that, that was one of the roughest, one of the roughest times. That and and going through a retirement. Going through that's you know, a good one. Because we one. didn't, you know, 
We didn't have that countdown to retirement. And we didn't have that walkout ceremony. Nope. That, that well, I, had a throw, I had a throwout ceremony. Yeah, I didn't even have that. <laughs> That's that. not even talking about me. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get into that later. Literally got thrown out. I, I actually went back to my department for the first time last week. Really? I had such anxiety even pulling in there. Oh, I, had to wow. go, I had to go make out a, a police report. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I told yeah, you about that. thing, yeah. Oh. yeah it's a... And I actually went back, and it was uh, it was devastating to even go back there. Oh, wow. Some of the worst pain, I, it's it's always emotional pain. Yeah, you, you take physical pain, it sucks the first time you feel it, but if you feel it again, you're a little hardened to it, so it's not as bad. Right. Emotional pain, I don't think ever goes away. Like, that's something you can yeah. never callous yourself to. For me, I, I, I say it all the time. It's it's the death of my grandfather. You know, that was the guy that taught me everything. Right. He taught me everything. It's everything that I want to be. Now, he died when I was 22. Had he lived longer, maybe, you know, you hear that with kids all the time. They lose their parents real young. And, you know, say, he, say the person's 11 or 12 years old when they lose their dad. Well, they didn't go through those years where you're battling with your parents. So maybe if my grandfather would have lived longer and I was a real asshole, um, as opposed to Michael, remind you the small asshole that I am now. Um, maybe that relationship would have been different. Maybe, maybe I, he would have seen me in a different light, or I would have seen him in a different light. Right. But it's also my grandfather. You know, by the time I met him, he was a gentle old man, and I know he wasn't that way when he was younger. Um, you know, I never heard him curse, and I'm, he was a truck driver, so I'm sure he cursed. Uh, I, I think that has a lot to do with it. But that pain, I, I remember where I was, what I felt. I couldn't talk. Uh, I th- I was dating a girl at the time. I broke up with her because that's what you do when you go through trauma. You right. just you want to push everybody else away because you don't want to be hurt no more. And he started dating a guy. What's wrong with that? Hey, I'm never floated your boat. What's wrong with that? I'm not. I just want I just want to put it on record that he, he that's a that was a very bigoted statement. Oh no! I just said then you started dating a guy. It wasn't. It's not bigoted. No, I think it was a jab. Power, more power to you. I would think it was a jab. I mean, he's at a young age. <laughs> I mean, young and impressionable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, Schmitty, we know a lot about you. So tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Uh, I was a 15-year veteran of the Bloomfield Police Department. Uh, prior to that, I worked for the Hudson County Sheriff's Department. And uh, I made it to sergeant, provisional, acting. Mm-hmm. Uh, did that for about a year and a half, two years. And uh, I found a really bad drinking problem. <laughs> it got me into a lot of trouble. Well, my name is <laughs> to Tom. Bo- to my boil it is... down to one point, I had a bad drinking problem. Yeah, you know. Uh... But you had a you had a really storied career because you have been through some shit. You you got run over twice. 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 Yeah. Twice. Didn't you learn to move the after the first one? <laughs> no, I, I actually stepped into the second vehicle. <laughs> he had so much fun the first time. He yeah, said, "Let me yeah, try yeah, this no, again." So... So and then you were, were you you were in a shooting too. I had right? a shooting in two thousand six. Yeah. So uh, I never got any treatment for that. You know that was back in the old days of like I got hired the tail end and the tail end of the good times and the start of the, the new when era, the shit started. When what, the shit started. What year did you get hired? Two thousand one. So that's the same year. Same year as me. So yeah, they, yeah, there were good times in two thousand one, but you know yeah. then nine eleven hit, and, and even nine eleven. For police officers, wasn't that bad because we were we were friendlies at that oh, point. Oh yeah, we were, we were good people. Yeah, hey, how you Every, doing? everybody loved cops yeah, after two, after nine yeah, eleven. Everybody loved us, you know. Now you you know when you were on, did you did you socially drink? Did you you know we're obviously I, here to talk about the suffering of sobriety. Uh, I I drank socially. I drank actively. I drank while working. While working, I so it was there before you were a police officer. Oh yeah, I. I was an alcoholic from my teenage years. What's what started? Like when was your first drink? Like what? Four, 14. 14. 14. What Blackberry brandy? No, it was <laughs> Boone's Farm strawberry. <laughs> no, it was a can of blood. My father was like, "Hey, go get me a beer out of the fridge." I was like, "All right." I went to the fridge, looked at it, said, "Fuck it, let me crack it open." It took a sip, and I was like, "Man, this is fucking cool." And every time my father knew the beer, I was like, I'll get it, Dad. <laughs> Cracked it open, took a set. Your Dad, father's like drinking a lot these yeah. days. You know, my father's like, hey, my, my, why's my beer can a little fucking low? You know? You know, so there's a funny story about that. When I was about seven or eight years old, my dad and his friend were over, and it was 4th of July. They went outside, and they were drinking those Miller ponies. Okay. Remember those, those yeah. little ones? So I, I see them drinking beer. I'm young. I want to. You know, hey, they, they left it there on the table, and they went out on the front porch to go watch the fireworks. So I chug it. Like, I chugged a beer. And then I go, and then I'm like, shit, well, there's an empty can here. They're going to know I did it. So I went and filled it up with water. I'm seven. You know, I don't know any better. 
And my my dad's friend comes back and picks it up and drinks it. He goes, man, I got to stop drinking. The stuff starts to taste like water. <laughs> I swear to you guys, it's wonderful stuff. I thought you were going to say there was like a cigarette butt in it and you never drank again. Oh, oh, man. It was, it, but that's that's usually you, – you, I think that's a that's a rite of passage for father-son right. to, to sit down and have a beer with your, your kid. What? At what point did your father – know what you were doing well funny story i uh turned 21 my father was like i'll take you out for your first beer <laughs> my father grew up in jersey city so we hop in the car we go to jersey city i went to maris high school on the border of bayonne jersey bayonne. city and uh going to this bar we pull up i'm like oh shit i know exactly where we're going <laughs> he's, he's been, been there for the last fucking, five years fucking, fucking been there <laughs> in his marist uniform <laughs> right so we walk in fucking bartenders fucking cleaning the bottles and shit and he goes hey jack or john whatever his name was he's like turns around he's like, hey jim how you doing he goes out my son turned 21 last night and i want to buy him his first beer he goes what the fuck he's been coming in here for the last four years <laughs> Well, whoops, gigs up right G- there. Gigs up. My father goes, that's it. You're, you're, you're paying. <laughs> you know? So, but uh, yeah, it was pretty bad. I mean, I, I drank at work and it never caught on. This is before you were a cop? Uh, the electrical union, yeah. big, big, they were big drinkers. I guess it makes the zap feel a little less. You know? Well, I, I, was in, I was in a pipefitters union and it was like a rite of passage. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. lunchtime, you're going out. Yeah. As an apprentice, we we go out to lunch and we drink. Then the whole second half of the you know the whole afternoon, I'd have to go to different you know crews and say, okay, what do you want? Uh, just give us a twelve pack. Run to the store, grab a twelve pack, come back, give it to them, have a drink with them. Go on to the next crew. What do you want? Uh, get us a case. Go, you know, go get a case of beer. Come back, have a beer with them. Yeah. And you just wind up drinking all day. Yeah. So yeah. What, if you had to if you had to think back, you know, in hindsight, what what do you think? Like, why was the drinking there? Like, why did you start drinking? Was it something that was cool or did it, like you liked the way you felt? Uh, I think it was more of a family thing. My mother and father were big drinkers. Yeah. So I think it was just the way I grew up. It was like, like Mike said, like a rite of passage. Yeah. I was part of the family. We drank at holidays. We drank socially. Um, I would go out when I turned 21. I would go out with my old man, meet him for a beer. Maybe it's because your last name sounds like a beer. Yeah, you know what I mean? That's a, what it is. German beer. That's what it is. You know, but... Um, hey, sit down and have a Schmittler. Schmittler, <laughs> Schmittler light. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I don't know what it was. Yeah. And it was just beer? Was it anything? Uh, towards the tail end, over the last two years, it was when the beer ran out, that's when I hit the whiskey and the bourbon. It's quicker. Quicker. Yeah. You know. Didn't you... What did you do with hangovers? Like you start drinking again? I You're, did. You puked and rallied? What'd you do? I, I <laughs> puked and rallied. Pretty much. I white knuckled it. Oh my god! You know, I mean, I would sleep until twelve thirty, one o'clock in the afternoon. Wake up, three o'clock, the bar open. Go to the bar until the, until the fiance came home from work at five. Be the whole. I'd race home from work. Make sure she wasn't there by the time I got home. Cleaned up a little bit. Try to put the sober face on. You know. Yeah. And then she's like, oh, let's go out tonight. And I'm like, all right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Then was, well, it would be, so then you become a cop. Is there any, like, portions in here that are, that are sobriety-filled? The academy. The academy. The academy. Okay, and what do, you think, what, what do you think that was? Why were you sober in the academy? I wanted the job. Okay. You know, I did the electrical thing. Um, I loved it, but I really wanted to be a cop. So the six months or 26 weeks, whatever it was, I didn't drink. I was married at the time to an Irish girl. And, oh, that, uh, that's that's bad. So she drank. She drank for me. <laughs> and uh, she's coming here next week. We got a girl coming from uh, Dublin. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. 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 So uh, I wanted the job. So for that period of time in the academy, I didn't drink. Really? I think I drank one time in the academy. I did, we used to go out uh, when we got comfortable and easy. Until yeah. we used to go to because I went to Essex County and we went to Hooters afterwards. Okay. And we sit down and have a drink, and some of the instructors would come in and see us all sitting around drinking, and they, they had a problem with it. You got you got in trouble that Monday. Yeah, we did. Or we got so, or someone fought, if one of the recruits fucked up yeah. at a bar and got right back to the instructor. We we didn't Always. care though. I mean, it's it's but it was never. I don't think that was ever a problem at that time. But um, so you you get into the job. Like, when did you start picking it up again? Hanging out with the old timers. Yeah. They they love to drink. They love to drink. They love to drink. You know, 
Now, did we, we used to have it where I'm not going to mention people's names, but when we were in high school, we used to hang out along the river, Sake River. We'd put all our beer over the fence and we'd leave one six pack on the table. Oh, that was for the cops. That's cop exactly would come, what that cop is. Cop would come every week, take the six pack, say, How many times I got to tell you guys not to drink down here? Put the six pack in his car, he was gone. That was like the payoff <laughs> to him, you know? <laughs> I told you guys not to drink down here. It's at least at least you got at least you were courteous enough about it. <laughs> yeah, we paid them off. That's yeah, it. yeah. By the time by the time I got on, you couldn't do that stuff because they were watching you too much. Yeah. Well, I got on ninety six, and you couldn't do it ninety six either. Oh, really? So I mean, you know, times are times are a little different, maybe a little worse for the wear. But you know, how many of those those high school drinkers turned out to be alcoholics? I'd love to know the statistic on that one. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. You know, because that was or a, how many learn a lesson early and quit drinking right after that. I mean, how many times have you ever had that experience? Because I know I have. You drank so much, and you wake up in the morning and say, "No, nah, uh, I used to. I used I'm to done. wake up in the middle middle of the night and go outside to check the car for damage. <laughs> <laughs> I've peeked out the window quite a few times. You pull the shades over. It's car you know, I mean, there's a couple of times that the car was parked in the front bushes. My father <laughs> would wake up in the morning and be like, "Motherfucker." <laughs> What, what did you do last night, Tom? Right. Did I park the car like that, or did you? Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, did you do? At, at what point was it ever a problem for you? Like, was it? Did Did you ever say, "Hey, Tom, I got to slow down"? No, never. Never a problem. I was, a, I was function functioning alcoholic. Well, you had a good job, <clears throat> making decent money. I had a great job. I had a great yeah, and that, and that's how people accept it. You know, well, I, can't, I can't be an alcoholic. I still got a great job. You know, so um, my friend. Uh, 14th and 2nd, you see that book over there. This gentleman's name's Charlie Cifarelli. Charlie's been sober off of narcotics for 30-some-odd years. He's been so, uh, sober off of alcohol for, twenty, I think, 27 years. And he tells me that the, the true alcoholic is usually ultra-successful, you know, especially if you're the life of a party guy. Nobody wants you to change. Right. And you're, you surround yourself with enablers, and you're, you're, you do a good job at, at work, so... Your job gives you leeway. Like I'm sure your job knew you were, you were drinking. Yeah, I'm sure they knew. Yeah, prob- probably. As long as it wasn't getting away with the job, you right. were probably doing a decent job. And they said, you know what? We'll give him this one. Yeah, we'll give him this one. So you know, you know what we used to do on our last midnight in. A couple of the surrounding towns, we'd work the same schedule. So our last midnight in was their last midnight in. There was a bar that opened at seven o'clock in the morning, and we'd get off at seven o'clock. We'd call the surrounding towns and say, hey, listen, you know, it's our last night in. Why don't we go meet at the bar? We'd be at the bar drinking at 7 o'clock in the morning. Wow. <laughs> now, you're getting off of work, so it's like after work to you. Yeah. But you see guys in suits sitting there at the bar, having a beer and a shot, watching their watch because they know exactly what time the train comes. And like, yeah, I, I got time for one more. They do the shot. All of a sudden, the train would come in like two minutes. It, the place is right next to train tracks. They, they'd do that last shot. Certain time they'd run right out the door, jump on a train, and go to work. The Mickey's? No, no. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to give up the name of the place because <laughs> they're probably still drinking there. Yeah, exactly. So how how bad? How much would you drink? Like on a, on a normal day? Twelve pack. All right, a little bit more maybe. <laughs> maybe sometimes a little. All depending on the weather. You know, depends if I went to the bar that afternoon. Now, know. was it was it like a piss drunk situation or were you functional? A functional. Yeah. I mean, did you ever did you ever let loose sometimes and just go for it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I there was ne- one the last one was never the last one. Yeah. You know what I mean? There was times that my fiance would have to come to the bar and drag me out. Hmm. I was in Bayonne one time. She just fucking I must have drunk te- text her or whatever. She left Dick work. pick? Oh, uh, <laughs> probably. Uh, ass pick. Uh, who the fuck knows? I don't know what I did. Cow nuts. Uh, you know, but she left work for him park, drove to Bayonne, yanked me out of the bar. Now, what about funding, like finances? It's got to cost you a fortune. I was bad. I mean, I was living off the inheritance for my parents. Oh, so, that's bad. That's, yeah. that's bad. You know, my father used to tell me this when... Um, my 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 grandfather's brothers they they all drank i mean they drank so my uncle john my aunt josephine used to call my father to go down to the bar to get my uncle john cuz if he didn't do that he was going to drink his whole paycheck away right i mean that's that's true alcoholism where yeah. you just don't care yeah. and uh, but you you never had that problem so you again you're you're falling into that functional category oh, yeah no I mean, when when i was in construction we i was working in bayonne and there was a bar that used to cash our checks for us. 
So you'd go in there and they'd take a dollar and whatever change you have, cash your check, and you'd sit there with a ton of fucking money in your hands and drink all through lunch, and then you'd go back to the bar after lunch. Yeah, that's dangerous. So many guys spent, like, their whole paycheck in that day. Oh, yeah. And we were making big money back then. That's a shame. Now, you, you, you go along, you get this police job, you're, you're, you're dabbling a little bit at work. Who's the first person that came up to you and said, hey, man, you might want to slow it down? Somebody had to come to you and say, hey, bro, what are you doing? Oh, uh, definitely. Doc Stefanelli. Doc Steph. Doc how long Steph. How long ago was that? You've been going to Doc that long? I've been going to Doc Steph since 2014. <laughs> he was like, what the fuck are you doing? What are you doing? What are you fucking doing? Schmitty, you got to stop the drinking, Schmitty. Schmitty you got to stop the drinking. <laughs> well, every once in a while, before you, before you cleaned up, uh, Doc would, you don't know this, but Doc would put out a text to the rest of us and say, hey, I'm worried about Schmitty. I'm worried about him. Well, see, I don't, Schmitty, I don't even know if you know about this. We almost had an intervention. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Your, I believe it was your wife or your fiance called Dr. Steph and said, I can't control him anymore. You know, he's in a bar in, in Bayonne and, you know, he's, he's not coming home. So yeah. we, we were about to have, we were going to go up to your house one day, right? Yeah, we were on our way to Franklin. We were, we were on our way up to your house to go have like an intervention with you. I believe it. And then your fiance put the kibosh on that and I don't know whatever happened with it. When did it start ruining some relationships, though? Uh, probably two years, two years ago. Two years ago? She started to fucking have a problem with Well, you it. said you were married before. I was married before. I was married yeah. for 10 years. Now, did that, did, was it, did that dissolve because of alcohol? No, that dissolved because I had fucking affairs. <laughs> <laughs> Which were brought on by the alcohol. <laughs> That'll do it, you know? <laughs> well, where, where is a better place to meet women than in a bar? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I saw to stick my dick somewhere where it should have been. <laughs> and it wasn't in a beer bottle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Smitty, it's refreshing to hear somebody own it. It really is. It's, 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 what happened with the police? Because something happened with the police. I'm not 100% sure. I, after I got hit by the first car, <laughs> yeah, let, let's let yeah we'll, just, we'll put it incident number one and incident number two yeah yeah that was uh 2012 he was drunk he couldn't get out of the way <laughs> it's not a bull right uh that's when the whole ptsd came along you think that was because of the shooting i think it reared its ugly head again it, yeah definitely mike that's yeah. the word i was looking for um i started having flashbacks and uh, the drinking took it down. I started hitting the bottle really hard. And um, yeah, you had to probably drink extra because you were numb half the time. Yeah, those two years, 2012 to 2014, I was really, really bad, out of control. And uh, Christine was like, "You need help. You need help." Christine so, is your fiance. My fiance. Okay. She was like, she was the one I was having an affair with, so I'll just put it out. <laughs> <laughs> so at least something good. At least came you were out committed. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you were committed. Still committed. So uh, she's like, you need help. So uh, I was looking around, looking around, looking around, and I found Doctor Steph through the PBA. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started seeing him in 2014, and he's like, you need help. You need help. And uh, I got diagnosed with a PTSD. And um, I remember when we when we were in group together. I was trying to beg you, like, bro, you got to go. You got to retire, man. You can't do this no yeah. more. I was trying. I think that's just when I got in there. Yeah. But so, what did we do after Dr. Steph meetings, though? We drank. We, we, we drank. went out and we had a couple of drinks. Yeah. yeah so, so Smitty, Smitty, you were there from the very beginning with, like, Andy and Todd and all yeah. those guys, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, was yeah, I, it I Jose? Jose and uh, Jose Brito. Yeah. Yeah. yeah all the, all the yeah. original guys. All the original guys, yeah. yeah. I started off at the, I would imagine, the end of 2014. Right. These guys we're talking about here, I think it already moved on. Yeah. And there was an Asian guy, too. I can't remember. I can't remember. He was with Passaic. Passaic. Passaic, yeah. A couple of those Newark guys. Uh, they Will. came in afterwards. Yeah, yeah Billy and stuff. Uh, second round of uh, misfits. Yeah, <laughs> the first one. First one was pretty bad, but the first one. Did you, you did you come down to Piscataway with us that one time? Nah, no, man. we because that was the first time. I always say that group was the first time I felt normal again. We were out together, and of course we were drinking, and um, we sat at a we sat at a table outside at this restaurant. And there's there's still a picture of us to this day of the original group, and I, that's why I'm trying to think whether you were there or not. And um, that Pete there, yeah, I remember Pete. So he, um, that was the first time I felt normal being around wow. anybody. And even if we were drinking, even if we were unhealthy behavior, at least we trusted each other. Because that's what that's what that 
brain injury does to you. That's, well, that's the stress. whole thing with post-traumatic stress. And, and what group did for us is we got a bunch of like-minded, dented people, mm-hmm. put them all together in a room, and we could talk to each other. Oh, it's do you know with, with, with PTSD, you can't talk to just anybody? No. Yeah. So you, you start going this downward spiral with your job. Because it was, it was starting uh, when I met you first. Oh, yeah. I went to the Donald Sparrow. 2013 right. that I met you. I, I started not giving a fuck, calling out sick, using my vacation time, burning sick time. Uh, I started pretty much drinking heavily at work. Nobody, uh, like you asked the question, like, did anybody realize I was drinking at work? Probably, but nobody confronted me until the tail end of my career. And once they confronted you, what happened? It was like, you need to go to rehab. You need to go to rehab or we're going to fire you. So. What was your reaction to that? I was like, fuck you. I'm not going to rehab. Well, there's a, there's a middle story in there. <laughs> God, now might be the time for the, uh, the screen. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. You made some <laughs> you made some comments to some other of- officers. I know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. There's a... Uh, there's, there was really one IA guy. <laughs> There's always that one IA guy. He, you know what? He was pretty cool in the beginning. He was. A, I, I'll give it to him. He was a good cop. He was a good sergeant. But then there was a political change in town, mm. and he played. He went that route. Yeah, there were, you had some serious political problems yeah. in that department. Yeah. So uh, we went from a chief to a director, mm-hmm. and uh, he started sucking the director's dick. Choose what happens. That's a, it's not the, not the political term for it, but you I know it's a little you know, yeah, it's, 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 it's a law enforcement term. He was <laughs> supervisory <laughs> filating. Yeah, so uh, he gets put up into IA, and he starts going after guys. Mm. And for some reason, I thought I was cool with him. I hit his radar. Had a couple car accidents, drinking on the job, probably related. Uh, <laughs> probably. <laughs> So uh, he suspended me a couple of times for nonsense, you know, failure to do DMS training. Uh, DMS training? What is that? Oh, yeah. That, that was probably after you. That, That's after that you. Came, yeah. That came. That was a pain on, in the ass. Yeah, online training. Okay. okay. Instead of going and in, sitting into a conference room for training, you did it on a computer. But you know what's funny? Those things, those DMS, power DMS, they used to call it. Power DMS. Power DMS. They, they used to, you'd have to sit there for like an hour and watch this thing. Then they talk about how production was down. Right. <laughs> you guys aren't going out writing enough tickets. Because you know, I'm sitting here for two hours a shift reading this powered DMS mm-hmm. shit. So you you go off the rails. I went off the rails bad. You went off the rails. And to prove, we actually have something for you to show <laughs> our audience how bad you went off the rails. Drew, you got that thing I sent you? <laughs> we went off the rail. You went off the rails so bad. Worse you know, there's very few cops in the world that go off the rails as bad as you. <laughs> and there it is. So let me explain Thomas a little Schmittler. bit. <laughs> this is a track alert. So this is what's called a track alert. You'll hear them on TV shows as like a bolo given out. It's, it's sent out to all the different departments. And um, just kind of like th- this one is, is for an officer's safety. It's a threat alert. That's a threat alert. Because you had made some comments to some people that you were might have hurt, hurt them. I made a comment too. I was that's that all came out of a fit for duty exam. <laughs> Did you go up to Oakland? I went down to uh, it was in Morristown to this fucking bitch. <laughs> and uh, I guess tell us I, what you really think of it. <laughs> I was I was drunk when I went for fit for duty, and uh, she asked me you know a bunch of questions and how I feel I was being treated at the department. I was like, what well, is fucking this is motherfucking internal affairs. All I want to do is fucking kill him. If I had a chance, I'd fucking kill him. And then the exam went on. She thanked me for my time. I left. I drove down to Bloomfield, got a sandwich at fucking Bialante's diner, deli, or whatever you want to call it. Drove home. Fucking midnight. Knock on my fucking door. I have eight cops at my door. From three different towns. Because of this? Because of this. I had no idea that went out. Really? <laughs> it says, well, any officer who comes in contact with the above individual, please use caution. The <laughs> funny thing is, is, you didn't know that came out, but we, we knew did. that came out. <laughs> <laughs> is this Schmidt? <laughs> but this is this is a good <laughs> but example. But look at the picture. Oh, the, the that's, that's my DL. <laughs> that picture's bad, dude. Uh, that is a bad picture, man. Yeah. You you look like 
<laughs> well, that's the skinhead that version of Artie Lang. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this. I wanted to bring this up for a very. It's not to embarrass you. It's it's to show everybody how bad this disease is. Right. How bad? How far down the rabbit hole you can go? You were this functioning guy. You were a good cop. You've been through all these different <clears throat> things, and this is where it ended up. Where this it is get you. Where, this is where it ended up. Yeah. Now, after this, where did it go? I uh, had the cops at my door at midnight. They wanted all my guns. They said, you need to go to the hospital. I was like, I ain't going. <laughs> They're like, you got to go. I look at my fiance. She's like, yeah. I'm a cop. I know the drill. She's probably at wit's end. She doesn't oh, know what to do. fucking dog's barking. Well, she doesn't know what to do with you because you're a mess. Right. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. You know, uh, so I was like, you know what? Fuck it, I'll go. Uh, I caved in. What, they want you to go for like a voluntary commitment? Yeah. So uh, I went, went, went to fucking Newton, sat in a room. They have hospitals all the way up there? Yeah. Believe it or not, <laughs> it's like a little farmhouse. Yeah. You got one, one doctor. It's, it's, on, it's not even a doctor. Bells. It's just John. <laughs> He's, the, He's also <laughs> doubles as the veterinarian. <laughs> <laughs> and the pharmacist <laughs> and the mailman. So... Uh, <laughs> So I'm speaking to these doctors, and they're looking at, they got this bunch of fucking paperwork from this fifth of duty doctor, and I don't know what she wrote up, but they're flipping through it. And they're like, you need to be committed. I was like, what? I need to be committed. For psych? Yeah. Yeah. So they sent me down to this place called Carrier Clinic. I spent eight days there. And, uh... Was it, is Carrier Clinic a rehab facility? No, it was a psych facility. Uh, and they were even worse, because I've been in there. Uh, it was a psych facility. I was down there for eight days, and I'm calling Doc Steph like every day. Mm. Like, Doc, you gotta let me the fuck out of here. There's people down there fucking eating crayons and shit. <laughs> and I'm like, eating crayons, eat. stuffing them up in their nose. I'm crayons. Like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I was like, you gotta get me out of here. So uh, my PBA president, my state delegate, come down with my with the PBA attorney, and they're like, here's the deal: if you go to rehab. They won't press any charges against you. Oh, they got you now. They won't fire you. They'll let you, they'll let you walk away. No issues, no nothing. So I'm like, fuck you. I ain't going to rehab. Like, you got to go. Mm. It's just you only out. So I was like. You got no more cards to play. I was done. Yeah. My money was gone. And no, no more bets on the table. I was like, fuck it. I'll go. So they sent me to Florida House and, uh. Yeah. Down to Florida. I, I was very resistant to going to Florida House. Spent 90 days down there. I treat, You know what? And I, I, didn't, I didn't do the program. I fucking treated it like a vacation. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you uh, couldn't wait to get out to get your next drink? Oh, I came home the day. <laughs> I came home on St. Paddy's Day. Oh. <laughs> that, was, that was my release date. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Poor timing on their part. <laughs> <laughs> you know, did you go in there drunk? No, I was sober when I went there. You were sober when you were there? I was in carrier clinics. So I couldn't drink. Man, now what was what was the, your resist? You, if you had to p pinpoint something uh, about your resistance to work in the program, what what do you think it would be? You just weren't ready. I didn't think I had a problem. Mm. I really think up until really, yeah, <laughs> really. <laughs> that guy, that guy was functioning. That guy right there was a functioning alcoholic. When I heard about this. Knowing you and, and what year, when did this come out? Is there a date September, on September, uh, no, January 17th, 2018. So I had known you for about, I would say, five and a half years at this point. Right. I had never, I was so surprised at this. I'm like, Schmitty, there's no way. There's no way that this this is true. To be honest with you, when it came out, I didn't even recognize a face. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I read the name. I'm like, how many Thomas Schmittlers are there? I don't know, man. That looks like somebody that just ate 50 dicks. <laughs> <laughs> right after he killed somebody. <laughs> but you, I, I was so shocked because every time I have had contact with you, every single time, you had been calm, subdued. You were probably drunk. Yeah. But you were never excitable, ever. And for you to get this excited over something, I'm like, oh, my gosh, what happened? I snapped. Yeah. Well, snapped. That, that's, that's when you see the end coming. You know, when, when, you, when you realize, holy shit, I'm caught. Yeah. You know, then you go into defense mode. Now there's nowhere. You're right. You can't lie to anybody because no, you've been lying right. to you. You're Not, the world champion at liars at this point. At liar at this point. Oh yeah, they yeah. they actually call me a liar in an internal affairs interview. They're like, 
You're lying. We we got we we got you on. We got you. We got you. That's right. Mm. We know what you're doing. You know what? You said it to a doctor. You're done. I remember Doc Steph saying to me about you specifically: if you don't get some help or you don't retire, you're going to be fired. Right. That's what he said. He said that way before this. And um, so you go down the Florida house, you don't work the program, nah. you're not ready, you come back and you just start tying it on. Oh, absolutely. I went right back to drinking. Yeah. And it probably was worse. Yeah. Yeah. At what point, well, what happened between your separation with the police department? You just, not for you or they they don't want you no more? They don't want me no more. They, oh. they, 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 you know, we're fucking down with you. you no, right. you no second chance. No kidding. And how many years you had the pension system at this time? Fifteen. So, what what do you get? Something I got. I got my money out of the pension. Okay. You know your contribution. My contribution. Yeah. Yeah, but it's uh, not the way you wanted to go out. No. You know what? I got. I, I thought I had friends there. Yeah. You know, don't hear from anybody. So th- let me ask you this question, because I I've seen this where we we try to help somebody get to get to the right facility, get to the right help, and and they become so resistant that. At some point, they have to go, I can't do this no more because you're drowning and you're going to drown me with you. Do you think that's what happened to them? Are they really, were they were they trying their best and they just didn't know what to do? Sort of give up out of frustration? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Well, see, I mean, could, that could be another thing too. Shit rolls uphill. So if his supervisor knew he was fucking up, then the supervisor could get in trouble too if their supervisor didn't oh, come yeah, down. Oh, yeah, I had a supervisor take a hit for me. Mm. You know, I had one, I wanted them to write me up. And they said, I'm not, you know, they took the head too. I'm not writing them up. So they mm. took the head. Really? No, it's putting someone else's job in, in jeopardy. And how did that make you, did, did anything click in the back of your head? It's like, wow, you know, these guys are taking a hit for me. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, yeah. I, I felt bad. I was like, look, you didn't have to do that. I would have took the head. You, know, you could have wrote me up. It was for, I don't know what it was for, but. um, Probably had something to do with alcohol. Probably. <laughs> but, but on, you know, being an alcoholic, they say it's an awful selfish thing too. So you kind of felt a little remorse but it was like hey well anything me. any addiction any addiction or trauma what i've recently come to understand i understand it about myself it creates a, a a very narcissistic behavior in you mike has it i have it you probably have it oh, absolutely where the world revolves around you you know this is just my theory i'm i'm, I'm not no, you. i'm not a medical professional but the world revolves around you it's like well this person doesn't want to go out to the bar with you well fuck them they're ruining my good time. That's how that's how it's you, you perceive it. You know, people didn't call us. Fuck them. Well, they didn't know what to say. How many times you you say, "Hey, you want to go out to the bar?" And guys like, "No, I'm not gonna go." You pussy. Right. You know, right, right, right. Would your wife say you can't go? <laughs> you gonna be a quitter? <laughs> so you get back, you keep drinking. How bad did it get? It got bad. I mean, wasn't working. Mother passed away. Twenty twenty, my father passed away from COVID. That that hit me hard, so that was the two year mark. I just went downhill. And how deep did you go? I went deep. And June first, I uh, woke up, violently shaken, violently shaken, vomiting. DTs. DTs, fucking puking out my ass. Literally. <laughs> literally. <laughs> literally. Literally and figuratively. Right. Christine was at work. <clears throat> She's calling me all day. How you doing? I'm fine. I'm mm. fine. Nothing to worry about. She's like, did you take your medicine today? I was like, yeah, I took it. I'm good. She comes home. She looks at me. She's like, what the fuck happened to you? You look like shit. It's like, I feel like shit. I tell her what's going on. I go to the spare bedroom, lay down. I'm tossed. I'm turning. I can't get comfortable. I'm up. I'm puking. I'm heading to the bathroom. Finally, she needs to go to the hospital. I go to the the Redneck Hospital up where I live, <laughs> and uh, I walk up the registration right away. They're like, "You're going to DTs." Mm. It's been five days. It's been a total fucking loss of fucking consciousness. When I, when I went to rehab, they brought a guy in who was, I think they they he blew like a three eight. All right, so he was, but he he walked dead. He walked in. Oh, like he walked in. I walked in. Yeah, at three eight, he walked in, and I remember. Walking past his room, and they were they had him on, they had him on Klonopin. So the pills of Klonopin are point fives. Right. He was taking, I think, someone told me three point five or four 
or point or a 4.0 of Klonopin. That's a lot of Klonopin. And he was, you could see it because they, they had to keep the door open. So he's tossing and turning. I never went through detox. Like I, I didn't, I, I, I sobered up. I went into the facility sober. So I didn't go through that. I didn't understand that. But I'm watching this guy go through DTs. And the smell of alcohol coming out of the room right. was overwhelming. Was that you? Oh, Yo, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, she, she, she left my cell phone. And I called her up. She don't remember this. She tells me a story. I called her up. and go, where are my fucking sneakers? <laughs> I'm looking for my fucking sneakers. She's like, you're not, you're not leaving the hospital. Mm. She's like, you got to be there. You don't, if you don't stay there, you're going to die. And she's a paramedic. So she knows the signs. She knows what to look for. Is she drinking too? I mean, does she? She, she still oca- drinks. Occasional? Okay, social. Yeah. You know, we, and we still go to the bar mm. to eat. You have that beautiful near beer, right? Oh, fucking sucks, man. <laughs> Hi, Heineken. I love my Heineken, but man, you got to do something about your double zero. <laughs> he actually, he, you did send out a group text yeah. the other day. <laughs> sitting here drinking my fake beer. <laughs> sitting here drinking my fake beer. <laughs> right. So you're, you're, you're going through this detox. Take you five days. What did it feel like that first moment that you were clear? Oh, I was like, what happened? Mm. It's like, I was like refreshed. Mm. It's like, where am I? You really didn't know where you were? I had no idea where I was. <laughs> I, I remember walking into the hospital. I remember walking into the ER. And then from the ER to the private room, no clue. No clue. And you had no clue for the next five days. No, I, didn't, I couldn't remember if I even ate those five days. <laughs> Probably didn't. You, you, they, they have to keep you on 24 hours surveillance. Right. They have to make sure you're medically okay because once you hit that facility, you're their responsibility. Right. right. Yeah, so <laughs> did the staff come up and give you? Oh, man, I was talking to people. I mean, I was talking to dead people. I, was, I asked the nurse about my dead brother. My brother's been dead two years. Oh. I, was, I was asking, I was like, hey, you know. This is my brother Brian, and my f- girlfriend fiance comes back, and they're like, "Who's Brian? That's his brother. He's been dead for two years." Oh, he, was, he was asking wow. about him. Holy cow, that's yeah. crazy! So, what changed after you you went through detox? What changed? She, Christine. Christine. Biggest, biggest, right there. She said, "If you don't stop drinking, you're gone. You'll be out on your ass. You'll be dead." She was like, I give you three years. If you go back drinking, you'll be dead. You have cirrhosis of the liver. You won't function. I was, I was at the point where I was drinking. I was shaking. Like, I, my hand would shake. My hand, since I stopped drinking, my hand hasn't shaked. When I was drinking, I was puking. I'm drinking a fake beer now. I'm not puking. <laughs> but have you fallen since then? Once? No, no I haven't fallen. Uh, what's the what's that temptation like? Oh, it's the temptation's there every day. Yeah, it's there every day. I had a um, two weeks ago. I went to a food truck festival, and uh, I just figured, ah, you know, it's gonna be food trucks, whatever. And um, they have that beer truck there. Yeah, that beer truck there, and uh, that was that that was, that was a trigger for me. Really? That was a trigger. What'd you do? I just white knuckled it. You, you you did you leave? Like what? What are some of the tools you learned in rehab to, oh, to get away gotta, from that? There's got to be some kind of like safe zone for you now, where like you're starting to feel yeah, like you're going down there. You got to yeah, you learn your co- about- you learn your coping skills. You know your breathing. I'm big on counting. If I feel like this, you want to teach Mike? Well, Mike can't fuck count past ten. With I was gonna say on. Kevin could go to seven, and he's like, "Where was I?" <laughs> you know. But you know, I do, you learn coping skills and stuff like that. Well, that's what I want to learn. I want to I want to learn some of the coping skills because you've had this twenty year run, more than that, twenty you know twenty eight year run, thirty almost thirty year almost run, run of drinking. Of drinking, you know, you just don't stop that habit overnight. So no. you had to learn some tools. So what are some of the the tools that we can pass on to our audience? I definitely get a nap a day. Definitely get that in. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> um, breathing, box breathing. Box uh, breathing, the four in, four out? Four in, four out. And four down. Yeah. Yep. Box breathing. Like I said, I'm big on counting. Meditation. Meditation. I, I say it here. I say it here a lot. Meditation has saved me oh. more than I can tell you. Meditation. And uh, find somebody to talk to. 
I mean, I got you guys. I mean, you got I'm, inappropriate texts, right? I mean, that's what I do. I, that's that's my weird way of saying that I'm still here. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm good. You know <laughs> what I mean? I might send out something stupid, something like that my kid sent me or whatever. Yeah. But um, that's my way of letting you guys know I'm still here. Yeah, you gotta you gotta surface. Because everybody was really worried about you. Yeah, he dropped off for a while yeah. at one point. And everybody's, you know, we were texting. He's, I think we left him off of a couple texts. Like, anybody here from Tom? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That usually happens in our group text when when there's concern. You get left off of that fucking text. <laughs> yeah. I, hey, look, I, lo I left so and so out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, that's how it starts. Yeah, that's how it starts. I know. I know. I've been the the subject of that once or twice. I know he has been the subject <laughs> of that once or twice. You know, usually, usually it comes around our anniversaries where, like, hey, Kevin yeah. left the text. And yeah. I already know what's happening. Yeah. But yeah, you were left off some text for that reason because people I'm were sure. starting to get really, really concerned. I'm sure. And then you have some people on there that text nothing but alcohol pictures. Yeah. That's funny. Well, prior prior to that, yeah, you you were, uh, but you had that. So you even looked like you were going downhill. Like you went full bore down down the rabbit hole. Remember the long beard? You look like fucking Santa Claus. Well, I, I live in I live in Princess County, man. You had to fit, fit in. in. I, bought, I grew the beard. I bought the pickup truck. I mean, I went all in. Now, now you were living in Sussex and drinking in Bayonne. Yeah, that bad, and then driving all the way home. Yeah. Wow. I've. I, someone, someone was on your side. As bad as it got, do you realize how, how much worse it could have gotten? Yeah, I, I, I got out of a DWI. Yeah. Trooper came up, saw the plates on the truck, and was like, "God yeah. bless the state police." Yeah, <laughs> you're lucky. You're lucky yeah. it didn't happen around 2008 or nine. It would have did you. Yeah. They would have did you. And that actually, I've, I, I know that case. Why they would have did you? They, one of the troopers got banged for DWI at Caldwell because he hit somebody. There's nothing you could do. Yeah. It's a shame. Yeah, thank God you never hit anybody. I mean, that would have been... Well, you practiced. <laughs> yeah, so, was, it's it's 30 years of practice. Yeah. professional at this point. Yeah. yeah, I know how to duck and weave. <laughs> so do you, do Shuck you, and jive. I'm a big subscriber to the the one day at a time in, in many aspects of my life. Oh, yeah. You, do you subscribe to that? Absolutely. Because that forever, I can never drink again, is such a long well, time. Well, I look at it at exactly like... I'm 48. I think every day. By the way, I want everybody to know Tom and I are the same age. I'm the, all of a sudden I ain't so bad looking. Look at this guy. Looks like he got Put out. Put the of track pushes back up. But it looks like he got out of Chernobyl. <laughs> hey, but, I'm 56. But I'm doing all right for myself. Thanks, pal. Yeah. Okay, that makes us both Carry, feel better. Absolutely. On. Yeah. So, I I still can't imagine. Like I said, I'm I'm 90 days in. Mm -hmm. I still can't imagine being sober for the next 40 years. Why would you think about that? It's not here yet. Exactly. How about well, you think about sober, being sober for today. Right. And then tomorrow, I always say, you know, jump that hurdle when you get to it. You know, so tomorrow's a new day. I'm going to wake up, take my meds, got my dogs, got my lady, got you guys, got other support factors in my life. You know, the sad part is, is I don't know whether Mike feels this way, but I felt that, especially when things got real bad for you, we had to let you fall. It's not that we didn't care about you, because we really did. But in my, in my mind, there was nothing I could say to you, nothing I could do to you that would make you understand that there's people out here to care for you that it, it, just shy of saying, bro, you're, you're hurting us real bad. Right. You're hurting us. But, that, but getting back to that one day at a time thing, I live my life one day at a time. Like, um, you know, my relationship with my wife. It, it wasn't good yesterday, but it's good today. All right, so I'm going to focus on today. I'm not going to worry about the, the, the sustainability of that right now until I get some time in there. You got 90 days under your belt, so to you know, you know what that feels like. You you've already started to create that habit, right? But you know, it, we talked about this with running before. We we would go out running, have a tough run. Well, I just got to get to that next telephone pole, yeah. and then I'll worry about it afterwards. Right, right. You know. If, and you tell yourself, like, just get to that next telephone pole. Then we'll think about stopping. And then that telephone pole becomes another one and another one and another one. And um, so you can use it in all different aspects of your life. But with sobriety, jeez. You know, it's tough. funny. People say all the time, like, hey, how you doing? I, said, I woke up this morning. Yeah. Right. I woke up this morning. My feet started moving. Now I could take on today. Tomorrow, I'll wake up and then take on that day. I'll live one day at a time now. Right, right. I mean, I'd even do it with something stupid. I got a lot of hip pain now. Like, a lot of hip pain. I do something as stupid as that. And he where, calls me old. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, well, you know, it's easy not to have hip pain when you, you're five foot six. It's right. You're shorter easy. to the ground, yeah, exactly, gravity. Exactly. Um, hey, but, Joe, could you speed up that clock a little bit? We've got to get out of here. <laughs> I'm starting to catch heat. <laughs> but I, if I wake up in the morning and there's no hip pain, I'm like, great. Right. Well, guess what? I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. I got I actually got to get them done. But um, it's just everything in your life, one day at a time, one day, and have and surround yourself too. Because I imagine you had this group of friends for 30 years who were like, "Hey, Tom, let's go out to the bar. Right? Let's right. go do our thing." I mean, still got the friends in the electrical union. Mm -hmm. They're all coming up on retirement and having retirement parties and shit like that. I ain't going. No, I don't blame you. Yeah. I don't blame you. <laughs> Why put yourself in that position? You know, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm. What am I? I'm I'm like eight. I, I never counted, so I'm I'm like eight years where I haven't I haven't, I'm sober, and it, it's almost to the point now where I can I can say to myself, you know what I I got this I can do it, but I don't, but yeah. I don't because I know if I drink tonight, I I'll I'll get away with it, and then tomorrow I'll be like well, I got away with it last night I can uh, get away with oh, it yeah. tonight. So we, we we did go out to dinner one night and you had a glass of wine. I did that I did actually, have a glass of wine. Yeah, I was like uh oh. <laughs> and afterwards, I felt guilty as shit. I really did. I was like, I, I no, no, this this isn't me. This isn't me. So that could have went either one of two ways. I could have been. It could have been yeah. went bad. It could have went bad. And I I did it to be more social than anything else. But that's just not me anymore. Yeah. But um. So the repairing of your relationships in your sober life. Talk to me about that. Well, definitely working on a relationship with my son. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's 16 now. He saw all this shit. He saw, he saw the shit. Yeah. He saw it. You know what I mean? He, he saw it. He saw how I was acting. He would come up to the house and see me drinking. I would mm -hmm. drink around him. Mm -hmm. He saw my behavior. And then that's how you started drinking. Yeah. Do you realize that? Yeah. yeah. And I don't, I want, don't want him to go down that road. Well, they, they got, I, I don't know whether you believe this or not. I don't know whether there's any, any medical evidence of this, but I always was told since I was a little kid that it's in your blood. Like, it's in my blood. Oh, they yeah. say addiction's hereditary. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I believe that. And, um, but, you know, you, you so you're, the, that repairing of the relationship with your son, maybe he, sh he needs to hear this stuff that you're talking about to know how you started and right. the path that you took Yeah. so he can avoid it. Right. You know, we all want our kids to learn from our own mistakes. We yeah. make the mistakes so they don't have to. Absolutely. We do it so they don't have to. You're right. Right. So what's what's next for you? Like, you're, you're in IOP now, right? I'm in IOP. Uh, go three days a week. It's a uh, it's actually a good program. It's for uh, first responders and military veterans. Mm -hmm. What's it called? Let's throw out a shout out to it's them. It's uh, Recovery Centers of America. Okay. Yeah, I'm working with two really good counselors, Michelle and Brian. Do they know about the tracks message? They, we can send that over. We, we, we can send it to him if you want. Yeah, yeah, you can send it to him. Fuck <laughs> it. I'm gonna say this. He's fucking the, the, the guy Brian. He's he's a cop. He won't say where. Yeah, but uh, he'll get a kick out of it. Yeah, <laughs> they try to they, those those. Um, just to let you know, I've had that on my phone like since it. <laughs> I got it on my phone. It might be a Christmas card one year. Yeah, <laughs> that picture. We can do so much with that from picture. the Schmittlers. <laughs> <laughs> so what? What's new about sober life? What's different? How are you looking at things? I'm looking at things totally different. I mean, like you said, one day at a time. Uh, well, what's one thing? Just give me one thing that's changed since you've been sober. One thing that's changed since I've been sober is uh, he's got more cash in his pocket. You, yeah. you can finally get that erection you always wanted. Yeah, you know, I'm a little, a little short down there. <laughs> but uh, one thing that's been different, uh, my communication with Christine. Mm. We're definitely talking more. Get, getting, getting it out there. You went through that suffering with her. And she went through it, too. She went through it, too. Yeah, uh, You're not the only one that suffered. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I put her through hell. Did she ever look at you sideways now? Like, you sure you didn't drink? Yeah, she'll <laughs> ask. She'll yeah. ask, you know. And now, or, what, or if you disappear for a couple hours, if I if I say I'm going, I'm, I have a brother that lives in Bayonne, and we're going through some stuff with the house and stuff, and I'm like, hey, I have to go to Bayonne tomorrow. And she's like, oh. yeah, it's gonna be mm -hmm. like a nightmare for her. Like, oh she, shit, uh, she's like, oh, I don't want you to go to Bayonne. It's like that's her trip. Yeah. So what happens if you trip? Because we all trip from time to time. I'm trying not to. But do you have a plan in place? If you do, no, nah. no, I have no plan. I have no sponsor. That's what I was going to ask you. Did you go, go like twelve step program or nah, with sponsors, I'm, nothing like that? I'm white knuckle on it. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna get you in contact with our friend Charlie over okay. here. Okay. 
I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to have, I'm going to get pass on your information with your permission. And cause he's, I speak to him a lot about stuff and he's just got so much knowledge on sober lifestyle. Incredible, incredible guy. You're going to love Charlie once you talk to him. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, he really is a good guy. Because that's what it's all about. It's all about having the resources and surrounding yourself with the right people. And, you, you know, you always can reach out to us. That's that's not, but we're not addiction specialists. We don't have 30 years in the system. Right. We're not addiction specialists. Kevin's just a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Big one. Yeah. yeah. Right. He's Irish. Come yeah. on. Don't let him fool you. <laughs> He's half Irish. Gets with part of his <laughs> half. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, even like Kevin said, we're here for you. You know that. I know. Through, through this podcast, we've made so many connections. I mean, we have a lot of people. I mean, yeah. I think like Adam Burt would be perfect for him. Adam would be great. Have you found any type of faith or anything? Uh, no. I haven't found that quote unquote higher power yet. Yeah. You know, they talk about it in group. Right. You find, you have to find that's a that's a twelve step. That's a twelve step. Yeah. yeah. I, have, I haven't gone to a meeting. I've looked at meetings, but I'm like, ah, you know. well, what are even you, even Brad? Brad Brad would be good. Brad would be. He'd be real good. For Brad would be great for he you. He went he went to where did he go? Warriors Heart. Yeah. Um. Then you got P, uh, Erica Erica Blue from Blue Magazine. She's another one. You yeah. Know? So, you know, we we don't have these answers. We just know where to find them. Right. And that's that's what it's about. It's it's. And that's what this podcast has really done for us. It, it, you get into that spot and you're like, what, what the fuck do I do now? And it's not an embarrassment thing because, listen, no. I, I've, I've been in positions where I've, I've talked about them and they used to embarrass the hell out of me. Yeah, I've been in psych wards. I've been in rehab. Sure, some of the positions you've been in recently have really embarrassed <laughs> the shit out of you, if anybody knew it. <laughs> I tried to change the shirt before the show. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. I was starting to get a little sweaty. Had stains on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But you you gotta you gotta reach out and and forego your ego. If that if that ever does happen, just there's things that I do talk about before Mike so rudely interrupted me. There's things I do talk about that are super embarrassing to me. They really are. You know my relationship, what I did to my wife, um, what I did to myself, what I did to other people. Um, but you've already you you've. I know one of the steps is surrendering to your higher power. You realize you're already not a higher power, but you already surrendered. Right. This thing's bigger than you, and that's the surrender. You finally admit it to yourself. You have you have a problem. Oh, definitely. Right. So you've already hit that step. Oh, I know I'm an alcoholic. I know it's <laughs> it's there. It's it's in my it's in my genes. Yeah. I definitely know it's it's an addiction. I believe that it's part mental. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, we can go you know, it's it. funny. That, that's, that's one thing that Brad said, too. If you remember that on, on his episode, he said somebody came up to me and said, are you ready to surrender? Mm. He's like, I never surrendered to anything. Mm -hmm. He goes, he didn't realize what it was, and then he wound up surrendering to a higher power and turned his life around. So uh, so when the next time that comes, next time those thoughts come, you got to have that go-to person, right. whoever it may be, whether it's Christine, your fiance, you're, you're going to get married again. I don't know. Uh, are you doing? I've been engaged fucking eight years. So I, yeah, what the why, fu why do it now? You know, I'm we're, we're picking out colors for fucking siding. Yeah. yeah. Fuck? Why would you do that? You know, like, dude, you, you just recovered from one addiction. You're going to go into another addiction. Come on. Well, when you take her to Aruba for her birthday, you know, <laughs> make it a nice location wedding. And... Well, if you had your way <laughs> next year at this time, I'd love to have you back to see how much your life has changed. Right. And, you know, you got to, even if you trip, that's, it's actually, you know, it's, it's understandable if you trip and I, God, I hope you don't, but I'd love to have you back to just sit there and talk to you and pick your brain and find out what has gotten better in your life. Because, you know, you're 48 years old, your life ain't over. Right. You got so much left to do. You've never seen the world as an adult through sober eyes. You realize oh, that. I, I don't know who sober Tom is. <laughs> he still hasn't met Sober Tom yet. Never yeah, mind yeah. seeing the world through sober eyes. Yeah. Sober Tom. <laughs> sober Tom. So, sober Schmitty. <laughs> sober Schmitty near beer. <laughs> zero. Sh sober Schmitty double zero. That's it. That's it. But I'd lo I'd love to invite you back. Okay. If in in a year's time, find out where you go to make sure you're still working the program. And also, you got to remember, you, you're not bigger than this. I don't care how tough you are. I, I, that's something I've learned about myself. I'm not bigger than anything. So, and, and if you ever did trip, the the big thing is getting back up from it. Right. right. You know, because we so all you, trip. You're you're gonna have a stumble 
hopefully, like Kevin said, hopefully you don't, but even if you stumble, it's how you react to that stumble and pick yourself up and keep going. Right. So we're coming to the end of this thing, Tom, and you've, you've left a 30 year mess. I mean, it's a mess. <laughs> and he says that in a nice way. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. it is. It is. Oh, it's a shit show, bro. <laughs> hey, look, when you're at the bottom of the stairs, there's only one way to go it's to go up, yeah. right? And when you're, you're drunk on, and you're at the top of the stairs, you can go down in a heartbeat. You, you go down <laughs> real quick. Oh, yeah. So if you had to think about some of the stuff that you've learned throughout this 30-year journey of alcohol abuse, what do you think your suffering's taught you? That's a tough question. I don't think I have an answer for it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a first. Yeah, that's a first. That's a first. I've yeah. learned a couple things about you, though. I've learned that you you you're this unbelievably nice guy you really are you have a gigantic heart and funny as shit though oh you're, you're hilarious <laughs> so many texts oh out. it's crazy it's crazy and you have this one thing that is able to be overlooked because of all the great things about your characteristics you know it's it's like it's like seeing a, a masterpiece painting but it's just got that one little thing on the corner but unfortunately, that one little mistake on the corner is the thing that everybody looks at and everybody points to. But over time, those mistakes will fade. Those mistakes will fade. So all those great things that, that Tom Schmittler is, they're going to come out and they're going to see the light. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay, what else am I going to say? Okay. okay. Fucking queer. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to get deep on you, Tom. Oh, yeah, oh, Jesus yeah, Christ. He does, bring, he does this usually once a show. Bring me right back. <laughs> you bring me queer. right back. Tom, thank you so much for coming Thanks, in today. Thanks, guys. Thank Appreciate you so it. much. Tom, you're, you're a friend. You're a great guy. And you know we'll always be here for you. Thanks, Mike. And that's going to do it for this episode of The Suffering Podcast, The Suffering of Sobriety with Tom Schmittler, a.k.a. Schmitty, a.k.a. the track master. <laughs> and let's think about all the stuff that we learned today. It's number one, don't eat crayons. <laughs> It's not a problem until it's a problem, which seems to be your, your chronicle of life. Drinking on the job is never a good idea. Another bad idea is threatening your supervisors. But most importantly, Christine, and I want you to listen to this, Christine is your angel. Yes, she is. Okay. And that's going to do it for this episode of The Suffering Podcast. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Follow Mike at Mike underscore Felice. Follow me at Real Kevin Donaldson. And we will see you on the next episode of The Suffering Podcast. <laughs>